We're here, of course, to continue the conversation around care um, and how now it is represented in our storytelling. Um, as so many of you know, care is, of course, a universal experience, but shockingly, it is underrepresented in TV and movies and other pop culture. But we know that when it is represented, it, it really resonates. Wasn't that, that video was amazing. Um, and we truly know that stories uh, can integrate more care um, very authentically without uh, losing entertainment value, and they can still very much make an impact. Um, so, and in fact, new research from the Gina Davis Institute tells us uh, what we've heard from caregivers is that we don't see aging and disability care properly represented. But when care did appear, 75% of storylines highlighted parenting, which of course is quite important, uh, but care for older and disabled characters is unfortunately rarely depicted. Um, here are some other top level findings I'll share. Aging and disability care tended to be portrayed more as women's work, as mothers of disabled children, often shown to carry a heavier care load than fathers. Storylines featuring care related to aging and disability lacked diversity and overwhelmingly reflected the experiences of white, heteronormative nuclear families. And portrayals of care related to aging and disability implicitly reinforced ageist and ableist narratives that older adults and disabled people lack agency. A couple more. Uh, common core challenges such as financial strain, balancing care with a job or a personal life, and physical and mental health impacts on caregivers were often, of course, missing as well. And storylines almost never, that's less than 0.01% of episodes, they never mention any type of public or workplace policy that characters relied on, such as, as paid leave or Medicaid, and instead, stories tended to highlight care solutions rooted in personal responsibility, 20% of those stories. So, of course, we have some work to do, um, but we know that this work can be effective because there is a forthcoming research study with the Norman Lear Center that people respond truly positively to authentic storytelling around care. And of course, as Hollywood is starting to strive for more diverse and inclusive storytelling, we need to expand care representation to better reflect the realities of care. And that is what we are going to talk about today. I am joined on the stage by four gorgeous, incredible, intelligent women. Um, I'm going to introduce you to them now. Um, uh, Andrea Levant is a nationally and internationally sought after disability inclusion expert and the founder and president of Levant Consulting Incorporated, LCI for short, a social impact communications firm that offers cutting edge corporate development and content marketing for brands and nonprofits. Next, this multi-talented performer and advocate made history when she became the first Latina to create, produce, and star in her own network sitcom. And if you want to know more about her experience growing up as a first-generation Mexican-American in Texas, you can check out her memoir, Music to My Years. Let's hear for Cristela Alonso. Next, we have Denise Davis, who is a four-time Emmy-nominated producer and is the founder slash CEO of Reform Media Group. Along with Issa Rae, Denise is the co-founder of Color Creative, a management company creating a direct-to-industry pipeline for women and minority writers. <laughs> and then rounding out our panel, we have, uh, Ka wait, Kamala. Kamala, oh, shoot, you did, you did it. it, I did it, and I've drawn attention to it, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, Kamala Avila Salmon is the first ever head of inclusive, inclusive content for Lionsgate Motion Picture Group. She has led marketing campaigns for Janelle Monet and multiple TV shows and hosts the podcast From Woke to Work, The Anti-Racist Journey. Can you even? Okay. We're gonna start with Kamala. Okay. Why don't we see more care on screen and what are the biggest barriers today to more equitable, equitable care representation? So um, I think that there's a lot of pieces to this. Like in part, the way that most stories that are seemingly about women tend to be backburnered. I think care has sort of gone with it. We do know that care is not an issue that only impacts women, but because it has been so long defined as women's work, it tends to be part of women's stories. And despite the performance and success, of stories centered on women like Barbie and the hugeness of people like Taylor Swift and Beyonce it continues to be like, do we got a program for women? That seems niche. So that's one of the first issues. Um, 
I also think that like it does feed into a lot of the other isms, ageism being one of them. We have such an obsession with youth. We have such an obsession with a certain type of body and person, and that extends to race, gender, ability status, LGBTQIA, whatever is the norm. But I think the thing that actually is changing is that more and more we are starting to talk about the fact that the mainstream actually isn't just a white, cis, straight, able-bodied man. In fact, there's more people that are not that than are that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting marketing play when a minority group has been sort of created and held up as the, the norm and the majority and the rest of us are other. But once the other becomes 60, 70, 80% of who we're talking about, we are the mainstream, we're not the other. So I think part of the obstacle is to continue thinking about how in the process of any other story that we want to tell, whether it is an action, a romance, a comedy, drama, there is caregiving happening in each of those scenarios. How do we be intentional about weaving that in and showing that it is not a side story or sort of like a back burner plot, but it actually is critical to our society and it's helping to support each of us to do whatever it is that we are trying to do, whether that is sitting on the end of receiving care or giving care, it's a critical part of the human experience. And so the more we reinforce that every part of human experiences and every type of person's human experience deserves to have a story, we will get further and further, I think. Yes, so well said. That was so well said, but I just want to make sure anyone can jump in at any time. Does anyone want to, we're going to keep plowing through. Um, <laughs> okay, so Denise, what recent portrayals of care in narrative or nonfiction content are you most excited about? Yes, um, you know, I thought a lot about this question and uh, I will say I was surprised it didn't come up in the video, so I'm very excited to mention it because uh, it was an example that at least for me took me by surprise and um, the storyline in particular was that, uh, and a show that you would not expect it, um, but in Euphoria with the character mm -hmm. of Fezco and rest in peace to Angus yeah. Cloud, mm -hmm. but there, um, and, and seeing how that show unfolded over the course of the two seasons and the more you got into his backstory mm -hmm. with his grandmother and him being a caretaker for his grandmother, yeah. um, I was really moved by that and, and that was, um, I think, astounding for a few reasons right? One, we're watching a young man who is portrayed as a high schooler who's dropped out. You think he's, I mean, he is a drug dealer. He is not like the, the typical good kid. But without that storyline, um, you don't create empathy, right? And you also kind of understand his situation, which is he is, he's turned to this lifestyle in order to financially support taking care of his ailing grandmother mm -hmm. um, who was bedridden. And there was a very beautiful scene that brought me to tears when uh, we see him giving her a sponge bath in, in the bathtub, right? And so I think for a show like that, um, that is marketed and, and created for the Gen Z audience, yeah. um, I thought it was very powerful because often we see those type of scenes um, in shows that are catered towards an older adult uh, audience. And so I just thought it was um, just a poignant reminder for that generation to be able to see something um, in that way. Yeah, absolutely. It's so good that you pointed that out. You know, we at HFC, um, we support caregivers, but we help so many young people. I was 24 when my mom was diagnosed. My dad was her primary caregiver, but I was his caregiver in a way. Mm -hmm. And so many young people, especially, uh, don't get to see stories like that. And you're right, it was so very powerful to see that. I, I, I really appreciated that story as well. Yeah. Um, Andrea, what types of care experiences and dynamics do you hope to see content creators explore and what would have been affirming to see during times throughout your life that you, that you have provided or received care? I'm going to start with the, the last question it, and it's, I would have loved to see myself, you know, represented as a person who was born with a disability. Um, I didn't see anyone that looked like me, you know, on television. Um, I didn't see young people you know, uh, young people with disabilities. And I think even still when we talk about care in particular, it's often told from the lens of the person that is providing the care as opposed to the person who is perhaps, and, and even in saying the recipient of care, often it's one dimensional. So even if I am telling the story, it's as a person receiving care as opposed to the depth of even perhaps the care that I'm providing, the lens of interdependence, how in me receiving care, I can go out into the world and 
have a business and be married and all of you know those types of things. Um, just living life and experiencing joy and mm -hmm. happiness and fullness. And I didn't see any of that. Um, I think the other thing when I think about content uh, creators is um, is the the intersectionality of experience. Mm -hmm. And so I again. I identify as a black disabled queer woman and I think often uh, in depicting care or even disability it is uh, very one dimensional. It's, it's that one experience as opposed to the depth of, of story um, when you add in those layers, when you add in, okay, my experience as a black disabled woman is definitely not the same experience as an aging white disabled man who may have the same diagnosis as me, but the way that we experience the world, mm -hmm. and even more importantly, how the world treats us mm -hmm. and how we, uh, in essence, when we go out um, into the world, you know, it's a very different experience. And I think that if more of us, particularly with multiply marginalized identities, were centered and even uh, creating the stories, then um, we would have a lot more exciting content. I, I feel like that's the end, but I mean, <laughs> truly that was, I mean, that was like a mic drop situation there. I, I'm just curious, and it's okay if the answer is no, if you have, if there have been stories that you've seen portrayed where you've felt, I'm going off book here, um, you know, where you have felt at all, if there has been, and it's okay if the answer is no, because that's what we're talking about, how, the, how it has not been. And I'm just curious. It's okay if the answer is no. I mean, not fully. Not fully. I'll say not fully. I think the video that was shown um, pulls in different pieces, but sure. again, I'm still waiting to see, to yeah. see, you know, see me. Of course. Mainly not for me, but thinking about me 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and the choices that I made as a young adult or as a young person out of shame mm -hmm. because I didn't see myself represented. So I was trying to hide and not people, get people to not see certain aspects of who I was because there was nobody validating my experience, right. particularly when it came to um, things like needing support, you know, needing, you know, having home care services and things like that. Um, and even I think often when we see disability represented, the person just kind of shows up as they are and you don't see what it took, mm -hmm. you know, um, for them to get out of bed and come to work and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And so, again, not quite yet. Yeah. I think we're getting there. Well, <laughs> I, share, but sharing that is so important, especially yeah. to this room. So I appreciate you, you putting that out there for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can I add something to that, actually? Because Please. I think part of what you mentioned, um, Andrea, around the dimensionality of the representation, I think that a lot of times, like, what you see in stories really is very obviously driven by the creator, right, yes. and their perspective, mm -hmm. right? So while like there is such an intense amount of empathy that a caregiver can have in trying to tell and st tell a story about care, it becomes something completely different when it is in the hands of the person um, wh for whom the story actually should be about, exactly. when they actually are able to drive that. And we see it and we know it in every other dimension mm -hmm. of inclusion. So much of the work that we do around inclusive content is less about casting and characters and more about storytellers because when you get it right at the storyteller level, it just changes what the story then will be. It changes how the story will be depicted, who will be employed to tell it, who will be cast. It's like the most impactful decision that you make in the storytelling journey is who is that writer, director, producer that becomes empowered. Because there's so many stories and experiences that you have experienced, mm -hmm. Andrea, that yeah. one, we haven't seen, yeah. mm -hmm. but also we wouldn't even know how to right. tell. Right. And there isn't actually a need for you to have someone to tell the story for you. Mm -hmm. It's more about how do we create more space for you, exactly. um, for everyone to yeah. be able to be empowered to tell their story mm -hmm. because it just becomes different. There's so many nuances Absolutely. in what you said that I think would be lost in translation. A million yeah. percent. Absolutely. Lots to think about there. Um, um, so uh, we'll go to Christella. Um, this is also so important. Why should entertainment studios care about care? And what message do you have for content creators who are here today? So really quick, I am 44 years old. I don't want to brag. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my God, you look so beautiful. But my entire life, I have been a caregiver to different people in my family. Mm. I'm a first generation Mexican American. Uh, I had to help my, my mother with medications that she couldn't understand, doctor's visits when she could afford to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I had to be her caregiver just to under, for her to understand what medicine was, yeah. right? And then she got very sick. Well, actually, at the age of 13, my sister would move me to Dallas from South Texas. I grew up in a border town, McAllen, Texas. And um, her oldest, uh, her firstborn, my oldest nephew uh, is special needs. He has Kleinfelter syndrome. So she would move me in the summer so that I could take care of her, uh, of her son, my nephew. And I had to work a lot and learn a lot, you know, become very involved with Special Olympics, different programs. I was a teenager. I was 13 when I started doing that. When my mom was nine, when I was 19, my mom got sick and I became her primary caretaker and took care of her until she passed away when I was 23. I was forced to stop my life. My whole dream was to come to Hollywood and perform and tell stories. And my family thought that was silly. Mm -hmm. And you need to step up because you don't have a real job and you have to come and take care of everybody, mm. right? And that's what I did. And I took care of my mom and at times I hated it. I hated, I was so full of anger. I was so full of sadness. I couldn't believe that somebody else had given me, the, had given me no choice and told me what my future was gonna be. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the, uh, my first stand-up special for Netflix, it's called Lower Classy. And the last 10 minutes of it, I talk about my mom dying, you know? And basically, I get called and she has, you know, she's on her deathbed and, you know, we don't, we, we're not very emotional in our family. We don't tell each other that we love each other. It's kind of assumed mm -hmm. because yeah. we grew up in the same house. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you know, so like when she was passing away on her deathbed, I, I thought to myself, like, I have to tell her how I feel, mm -hmm. even though it's going to be so awkward for her. Mm -hmm. Right, and I told her, I'm like, I love you, and I, you know, I, 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 you know, I owe everything to you, and I can't believe you came from Mexico with nothing, and I just get to live this life that just is so different from yours, you know, and I just want you to know that. And then she didn't die, <laughs> right? <laughs> she lived for another year, <laughs> and every time I would not want to do anything for her, she would be like, oh, I thought you loved me. <laughs> Right? Oh my God. <laughs> you gave her an extra year. Now, having said that, my sister had a stroke two years ago. Mm -hmm. She lives in Dallas, and I live here, and I become her caretaker now, too. You know, and I've taken over her business affairs and everything. And again, uh, and I do stand up, and I travel, and I've always wanted to tell those stories. So, mm -hmm. what you were saying about the storytellers. I was always told that I could never be on TV because I was considered plus size mm -hmm. and I had a crooked tooth. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we don't, we're, that's not what we're looking for mm -hmm. on screen, mm -hmm. you know? So that's why I created a sitcom mm -hmm. and I didn't think I'd get on TV because I was still plus size and had a crooked tooth. <laughs> but when I got the show on the air, the character of my mother was based on my mother. Mm -hmm. And in the show, I wanted to show her dying. Mm -hmm. Because I thought it was important to show that. Because in the 70s, you mentioned Norman Lear. Mm -hmm. You would have shows mm -hmm. that would tell stories about life, and they didn't have to be funny all the time. Mm -hmm. They could have moments of reality, and that's what connects people. Mm -hmm. it, like, I'm Latina, but I always say that as different as we are, the more we have in common. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, I don't care if you're a different culture, if you, what have you, we still have so many things that we connect with. The thing about caregiving, what studios have to do is actually trust the storytellers that have caregiving experience mm -hmm. to tell those stories and not tell us how to tell our stories yeah. because they don't know how, right? So, you know, and it's hard because when I had my show, being the first Latina in 2014 mm. to ever have a network sitcom, you mm. would think we should be further yeah. ahead. Mm. And that's what we still see, right? Like, we're talking about caregiving right now. We're talking about diversity. We're talking about inclusion. But let's be real. When we use those terms, diversity and, and, diversity mm. and inclusion, mm. there's two groups that really use them. Mm -hmm. 
the people that are affected by it and need the change and the people that want to stop you and tell you, mm -hmm. well, we can't do it because of diversity yeah. and inclusion. Mm -hmm. But really, the truth is diversity is, inclusion is an accurate representation of what so life is like, yeah. right? So yeah. it's like that thing where for me, I found out I was diabetic years ago, and I remember thinking, I want to tell a story where I'm diabetic and I'm taking care of people like I always do. I'm the youngest of four, but I'm everybody's caregiver in my family. And everybody, a lot of people are like, oh, that sounds too sad. Mm. Mm. And the thing is, is that it's not my fault that that's your perception of it. Yeah. Mm. Because throughout taking care of my oldest nephew mm. and my sister now and my mother and, you know, just... I've learned that so much joy comes with it, mm. but also anger. And you want that full evolution of a character because that's what life is like. Mm. So when studios, I always tell people, like studios will always say, networks will always say, well, we need more black content. Mm. We need more Latino content. Mm. We need more Asian content. Like no one ever says, we need more white content, Never. right? <laughs> you know? It's, yep. So why do they put us into these like buckets, into these yes. boxes mm -hmm. where what happens, we're taught, you know, people with disability, people that are marginalized, we all start co competing against each yeah. other, yeah. you know? And it's yeah. just like, but why? Why can we have so many stories of white people doing white things, supposedly? Yes. Mm. Come you on, know? I always say this, and I'll end it, and I'm sorry I'm running so long, but no, like, Latinos, like for me, I always use this example. Latino shows, right? Uh, if it's a Latino show and there's a, an episode, you know, uh, well, actually, let me talk about the white perspective. The white <laughs> sitcom, there will be an episode where, let's say that the family loses power, right? The, a light pole, like some, some accident happened, they don't have electricity, they have a little round, talk, you know, they, they talk, and they've never talked because they're so connected to technology, right? And <laughs> they all figure out that they've never, they haven't been bowling in over a decade, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know what, let's go bowl, mm -hmm. right? And that's the end of the episode. Latino shows, we have no light because we're all broke as hell. <laughs> we can't afford light. What's electricity? Like nothing, right? And then we talk about maybe going to bowl because it has light and air conditioning. Mm -hmm. And it's in the dead of summer for some reason. And there's one person that won't go because they're undocumented and they're afraid of living their life. Mm -hmm. And then the grandmother has to talk to him, mijo, I did not come to this country. <laughs> So you do not go bowling. Yeah. And that's the end of the episode, and we right. never fucking, we never go bowl. Right. Well, you never bowl. You know, and it's just like, why do other people get to live out a story and yes. we don't? Why do we have to carry the backs of everybody that we represent, you know? And with caregiving, you can't tell me that none of us, every single one of us, has taken care yes. of someone yes. or, you know, or forced to give, you know, had the experience of struggle with that kind of thing, but also the joy, the memories, mm -hmm. the everlasting effect, because all the caregiving I've done has made me who I am. And it's allowed me to tell stories that are a different perspective, but the, uh, the truth is the studios and networks have to trust us. If you want to be represented, and I want to tell a story with you, I need to consult with her yes. mm -hmm. to get her life, to get an accurate representation. It's an homage and it's an honor mm -hmm. to represent people that haven't been, haven't been represented, but in order to do that, we have to trust ourselves. Yeah. When are we going to be allowed to trust ourselves? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Didn't I say it was going to be a good panel? I mean, mm -hmm. truly. Um, I feel like, Christelle, you kind of opened us up to this, which is how, I, this is for all of you, but how have you woven care into your own creative work, and what are some challenging and rewarding moments in doing that weaving of your care stories? Mm. Who wants to go first? Well, I guess I'll talk about uh, the, the insecure storyline with, with Molly and her mother in the last season, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we, we had such a phenomenal group of writers in our writer's room. We have very low turnover, so we, that means we had the majority of the same writers from season one to season five. I think we only 
switch it up a few times. Um, and I bring that up because everything about that show in terms of how authentic it was, was really uh, a combination of everyone's voices that were in that room and everyone's perspectives. And when it came to um, Molly's storyline with her mom, you know, I think there was a huge conversation um, that happened in the room about uh, like, adulting to this degree and having seen our characters at this point grow up over the course of five seasons which in our show world meant you know five years and especially with what we did with the finale and, and traveling ahead we thought it was so important to talk about how um, the timing uh, can happen at any time right the shock of it and, and it wasn't something that we laid out it's something you didn't know what was coming but I thought it was um, it, it was important for all of us to make sure that we handled it um, as authentically as we could in terms of seeing what that type of care is like in terms of the preparation for it and I think the shock of it and the, the bickering of the family in terms of everyone having a different opinion about how they wanted to um, uh, address it, right? And um, I'm very proud of it because I think for a show that um, we always say it was like intentionally black at every level, um, <laughs> to be able to interweave that smaller line in one of our major character storylines um, was significant, right? Because I think across five seasons, it was so important that at every level, uh, we did things that felt real um, and that didn't pander because it felt like drama for drama's sake. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were really, um, you know, we, we, we handled it with a lot of care. Our, our showrunner actually went through a lot of things with um, with his own father going into the last season. And so, like, all of that that human emotion was, was put in there. And, um, and I'm proud of it, you know, and, and I think even by the time, makes me tear up every time, but when you get to the finale, no spoilers, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but spoilers, um, when you get to the finale, and you also, you know, we skip ahead of time and you, you're at Molly's wedding and you see that photo of her mom there, mm -hmm. right? And you realize the significance and the time that's mm -hmm. passed. And so, you know, I think to be able to even show that from a bookend standpoint, right? To where it's, it's not, it's a happy ending for her, but you do also get to find out like what happened when it was, when it was all said and done after a few years. So anyways, I'm very proud of it. Um, yeah. it's, it's something, it's one of the few projects I've been a part of that was able to, um, put caretaking in it and I want to piggyback on something Cristela said really briefly which is um, I, I wish across Hollywood at all times when it comes to stories about inclusion and disabilities um, I'm, I'm personally very tired of like the trauma sake of it mm -hmm. right and I feel like okay like we're gonna make a black film or it's gonna be about race well we have to have racism and you're like or you don't, they can just be right, normal right. people. Yeah. Um, and when you I call it agenda porn. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Well, because it's trying to, you know, I think stuff this trope, this, this idea that, oh, this is the relatable part, right? And something that Andrea said was very true, which is like, yeah, I wanna see a queer, black, disabled woman just living her life and dating and having friends and her struggle is actually about something else that's not necessarily about her because she's confident in who she is. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we can push stories um, in all of these spaces to be just normal and normalize it, I think the wider the spectrum is because storytelling at the day is, is the most universal when you're able to hit on human emotions like that. Um, and so it's just something I want to see more of in terms of Hollywood because I think the default is often like, well, let's show the, you know, the, the regular person and the transformation of them getting to this. And it's like, yeah, that's true, but what about normalizing them? What about showing them as a regular human? The transformation thing is what mm -hmm. bu bugs me so much. When I was pitching my show, uh, I remember everybody kept saying, can they just ascend? <laughs> and I thought, like, that's the favorite, one of the best, like, most wow. commonly used notes I get for everything. It's like, like, ascend what? Like, ascend, yeah. like, meaning, can you be poor and then you become, like, more successful at the end? Because it's easy. You know? Like, and you can't just be just, successful. And I'm like, why can't I just be a Mexican Cosby show? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know? Like, but also, you know, it's like, to me, I'll just piggyback off, like, with the question. For me, in my example, I don't get things, I don't get cast in things unless I create them myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Because people still aren't writing those stories. You know, it's like, I always say, especially as a Latina, like I always say that we were around during Aztec and Mayan times, and then we hibernated for centuries. <laughs> and then in the 70s, we came back and we're sex pots. And then like the Latina women were sex pots in our 20s and 30s, and then you have to hibernate again for two decades, and then you come back as the abuela. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and, and that you know, and that's kind of what it is. Sure. But like for me, it's like I've I've been an avid supporter, and I've been a like you know like Special Olympics. And to me, I always think like, why can't we show the games? Yeah. yeah. Why can't we show like it's so much fun? Yeah. You know, you can, there's a, a hugging coach. Like there's a coach that just hugs the athletes to make sure that they feel like safe and nurtured and that they, they, they you just celebrate them. You're like, I'm a hugging coach at state games in Texas, you know? And it's like, that's a lovely moment because you see them and you just like, you can't beat that joy, yeah. you know? And it's like, well, how many people know that hugging coaches existed? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, that's the 360 of the world that I would love to see more of. And I think I, so one kind of on the other end of things, thinking about the trauma and often the way that joy is depicted is that then we, particularly those that are receiving care, disabled people in particular become the point of inspiration. Mm. Oh uh, <laughs> and so we're then we're what we call, or what's been coined inspiration, inspiration porn, porn, which is yeah. that we exist in order to make mm -hmm. the audience feel better about their, oh my God, she got up in the morning, so I can too. You know, like, <laughs> and if, if she can drink her coffee every day and go to work, then that's what I, you know, like, and we don't. We don't exist for that yeah. reason at either. And so I think that in the normalization, that's exactly what it is. It's that, yeah, I have shitty days and I also have great days and I have wins and I have losses and they all often are not related to my diagnosis or disabled experience. It's just the, the world is hellfire. And so that's like, <laughs> you know, it's what it, what it is. So I, 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 there's just, again, it's that, that depth and normalizing mm -hmm. of, of a holistic experience that I think is important. Yeah. Absolutely. I feel like there's almost like this tension sometimes between intentionality and like organic or authenticity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what you will hear in Hollywood is like, I just want the inclusion to be organic. Right? right? But part of what that means, like I have seen what you've done when you do what is natural to you, right? You exclude. So there's no problem that we can perceive that we're working on that's gonna get solved by not working on it. And just right. hope like magically, we'll just all think good thoughts about including the right stories. And then just like, I don't want it to feel forced. And like, I'm not talking about things feeling forced, but I think in all of the stories shared here, there's a level of intention where you have to decide, this is something that I believe is important for us to incorporate in an authentic way. We are going to take the proper steps to ensure that that is done. That might mean bringing in a different writer. That might mean yes. bringing in a consultant. All of these things require effort. Yes. And that doesn't mean that they are forced, but you have to have intention in order to get the aim that we're looking for. And so I just think it's, it's a really interesting piece of it, as well as Part of where the struggle is, is across all inclusion issues, you're constantly trying to get people who are not you to remember you. And so we have to kind of flip it and really that. think about like, how are we putting people in the seats of decision-making power that authentically reflect and have these experiences? Because I, I'm such a big um, disciple of, I don't talk about black movies because mm -hmm. we don't talk about white movies. Right. Like, why are you counting? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. that black is not a genre, right? Mm. Care is not a genre. Uh, yeah. Like, gender is not a genre. Like, yes. what is the story about? And mm. how can you weave in as many interesting, different, unique experiences that will give the audience that sense of, like, a familiar surprise? Mm -hmm. um, oh, I kind of, this is kind of like my family, but it's totally different from my family, mm -hmm. and it's yes. hilarious, or it's really heartwarming, yes. or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think we have to kind of both think about the decision-making element of it, and like be unafraid and unashamed to say, no, we're going to put effort into it. We're going to show intention. We're not just going to hope it shows up. I also think it's important to, uh, b like what you're saying, I completely agree. And I think that there's also a step further where the creators and storytellers need to actually learn that sometimes they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and they need to accept it and not pretend that they know everything. I mean, that's the whole idea for me about like cancel culture, right? It's like, to me, it's like, no, we're supposed to evolve. Yeah. Words, some words you should have never been saying. Yeah. You know, some things you should have never been doing. But we use, some people used it because that's what everybody was using. Right. So when you tell storylines and you're doing something that's offensive to a, a community, don't bank on it and say, well, deal with it. Right. Like, no, it's like you have to learn. You will make mistakes, but eventually you'll get to a point, we'll get to a point where everybody's story is adaptable and understandable, and we know that they're, they come from specific point of views. Yeah. You know, I think that's something we have to work on. Really well said, and I think that's, that is unfortunately our time, but what an amazing way to wrap up this very important conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all of these personal stories here today, but also in your work, which is so important. As we've said, Hollywood is very uniquely positioned to share these stories, to share the reality that so many people face, um, and to show that care is such an essential role in our lives, in our society. And I think by having conversations like this, by having everyone share their voices, hopefully change will happen. So thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the day.